Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to our online worship today, uh, Congregational Church of Eastford. So glad you can be with us. I'm really excited about being together as a church family in a couple of weeks. Right now, our target date is June 14th, when we will be able to gather uh, for worship. And at the same time, we'll make it possible for those of you that aren't able to be with us uh, for your health and safety to worship at home uh, via live stream. So uh, perhaps uh, this might be about the last time that you'll see me broadcasting from home. And I'm just so excited to be together again. I believe God's people belong together. When we worship and sing together, it's an encouragement. When we are together in his presence, the spirit can move sideways among us. I'm so excited about that prospect. But you know what? Right now we're together. We are bonded together in the unity of spirit, the bond of peace. Our, our great Lord Jesus said that where two or more are gathered in his name, he is in their midst. And so he is with us right now. And so I invite you to just join me as we speak with him in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanks for this beautiful day. And Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us together. I ask, Lord, that you would bind us together now by your spirit, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, that you would open our hearts to your throne as we pray and as we hear from your word. Lord, may this worship service be pleasing to you as we surrender ourselves to you in worship. Lift our hearts heavenward now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I invite you to join us in musical worship, and you know what you can do? You can actually sing along with it. So if you haven't done that before, give it a try. It is between you and your Lord. You're worshiping Him and not watching a show. So I hope the music blesses you, and uh, join us now as we sing together. be your name, the land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, found in the desert place, a walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. be your name, the sun shining down on me, the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, the road marked with suffering, there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.
Savior, I come and quiet my soul. Remember redemption's hill where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I want. cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Precious Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we worship you. You are worthy of all worship. You are a magnificent God, a God of splendor, beauty, power, and might. We thank you so much, Lord, for being a God who loves us. We thank you for your mercy, for your compassion, for your grace. Oh, you're so good to us. You are a good, good Father, and you're such a one and only Son whom you love to Make it possible for us to know you. Lord Jesus, we honor you, we praise you, we worship you. We thank you for laying down your life for us. And we praise you in the glory of your resurrection. And we know that right now you are seated at the right hand of the Father. You're alive, Jesus. We thank you so much, Holy Spirit, for being with us, filling us, leading us, teaching us, showing us the truth, giving us power, refreshing us in love and joy and peace and all the fruit that you bring. What a great God you are. Father in heaven, we do cry out to you this morning in our time of need. 
We pray for all of those who are ill for healing. We pray for caregivers in this pandemic, for courage and for strength and for safety. We ask for wisdom for policymakers. Father, I pray especially for people who are feeling alone and lonesome, that you would be their companion. I pray, Father, for those that are dealing with fear and anxiety, that you would replace that fear with the strength of knowing you, that you would take the anxiety away and in its place bring peace. Father, I pray for those that are despairing, that you'd replace their despair with hope. And for those that feel alone, that you would flood them with a the knowledge of your love. Take good care of us, Lord. We plea with you that you'd meet everyone's needs, whether they're emotional, spiritual, physical, financial. We ask for your hand of blessing. And Lord, for your church, would you use this time to make us ever stronger in you, in our understanding of our profound dependence upon you, Lord, in our faith and our belief that you are going to do exactly what you have said, and you have a good and beautiful and perfect purpose in this difficult time of a pandemic. And Lord, I pray for each and every one in your church that we would be drawn closer to you. We would be growing ever more in the image and likeness of your precious son, Jesus. And that you would be preparing and equipping us for what comes next. But even right now, Lord, would you use us with power to bring the good news of Jesus to a lost and dying world. Father, I ask now that you would hear us as we pray together, as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we're going to open up God's Word now. We're going to be opening up to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 9. And you know, um, this past week and last week on Memorial Day, my granddaughters, the three of them, with their mom and dad, my daughter and son-in-law, they spent uh, an afternoon uh, buzzing around on a boat on a lake over in Rhode Island, and they had so much fun. And then Lynn and I uh, went to hang out with them and eat some ice cream on Memorial Day. And while we were with them, they were just so excited about the boat. And, and uh, of course, they're three, four, and five years old, but, but uh, their dad especially was egging them on. They said, hey, Grandma and Grandpa, they have a lake, and I, I bet, I, I bet grandma's, Grandpa's going to buy a boat. And so I was kind of like all in thinking about it, and boy, that would be fun. And, and then I started thinking about, well, i got to be careful here because I you know, did a little snooping around on my phone on Google. And... Boy, boats can be expensive, and I've never owned a powerboat, so I could get slicked by a boatyard salesman, and so i got to do my research. I have to know what the cost is going to be before I make that commitment. Jesus commands us to follow him, and then he gives us the choice to choose to obey that command and follow him or not, and he wants to make sure that when we make that choice, we know what the cost is. We're going to look at a text this morning that gets into just exactly that, explaining to prospective followers what the cost of following Jesus is, because cost is high, but praise God, it's worth it. So let's take a look at the text, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do ask, Lord, that you would by your word now teach us, refresh us, renew us, challenge us, encourage and empower us. Lord, you, you know what plan you have for your word in our hearts right now, and we surrender ourselves to that. Use your word in us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, when I was uh, in the Navy at the Naval Academy, we had the opportunity to choose whether we would uh, go drive boats, surface Navy, 
submarines, aircraft, be a pilot, or go in the Marine Corps. And in order for us to make an informed choice, those four opportunities, those four communities hosted us on like a one week at a time whistle stop tour. And I remember the first three, the, the, the ship drivers and the submarine drivers and the aviators, what they kind of represented to us was life would be fun and exciting. You could shoot big guns or fly a plane. And work probably ended about one or two in the afternoon. And, and then there was, of course, a free bus ride to the beach. And in the evening at the officer's club, prime rib, cold shrimp, maybe some pretty co-eds on a dance band. You know what the Marines did? We arrived about midnight on a Sunday night, 4 a.m. Monday morning. They woke us up. They put us in fatigues handed us a canteen and a canteen belt, stuck us on one of those cattle cars that you military guys will remember, took us out in the woods of Northern Virginia there in Quantico, didn't bring us back until Saturday night, and we got all bug bit and sweaty and hot and slept on the ground under a poncho in the rain. You know what the Marines wanted us to know? That if we chose the Marine Corps option, it would be difficult, challenging, and it would be an invitation to step up into an extraordinary new life. That's the proposition of Jesus. He wants us to understand when he says, come follow me. It's an invitation into a dangerous, adventurous, wondrous new reality. And it's not a choice to be taken lightly. Well, he teaches us in the context of three encounters here with um, prospective followers. One is a volunteer. As they were going along the road, they're moving from Galilee down to Jerusalem through Samaria. They're going along the road. Someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. <laughs> Jesus, I'm in. I'll do whatever. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to follow you. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <laughs> you know, traditional Hebrew life was based on God having given land to the descendants of particular people. And so land and family and home and the stability of friends and familiar and safe and comfortable was central to the life of these people in the first century choosing to follow Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you're going to give all that up because when you step into my reality, this earth is no longer your home. When I was in seminary, one of my classmates, I think many of you know him, Bob Beckwith, pastor of South Woodstock Baptist Church. Uh, he had married uh, a girl that had grown up in Woodstock, the town where I live. And um, he described life here as like life in the Shire. And he brought into view you know, that, that, that place in Middle Earth that J.R.R. Tolkien developed for the Hobbit and for the Lord of the Rings in Middle Earth. And, and, you know, when he introduces uh, the Shire and he talks about life there, Tolkien in, in The Hobbit has these words, In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit, not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. I love hobbits. They have breakfast. Then they have second breakfast. Then they have 11 seas. And the lifestyle described is, well, it's a lot like the lifestyle in Northeast Connecticut, of the beautiful rolling landscape and the forest and the blue sky and fireworks in the summer, fireflies, a good, safe, comfortable life. But then in Tolkien's story, <laughs> the Hobbit gets called out to go on a great adventure. Jesus, when he calls us to follow him, asks us to step out of the comfort of the old life we have. By the way, for many when Jesus says to follow, they already know their life's a mess. But so many more of us are in a comfort place with our friends and our family and the things we like to do and knowing our way around, having the cashier at the bank know your name and all these things that make life good at home. He says, no, I want you to do something bigger and something better and something way more exciting. A few years ago, uh, our youth group and their leaders, there, there were some kids and moms and dads in that mix, they took a mission trip down to Haiti. And when uh, we send out short-term missions like that, we usually like them to give a presentation of their trip. 
And this particular team, when they came back, we did not give them time to put together a polished, fancy trip. I, I think they arrived in the middle of the night on Saturday night, and we asked them to talk to us on Sunday morning during the worship service. And what I remember was like so profound because they had left the comfort of Northeast Connecticut. They'd gone down to Haiti where it was hot and miserable and things smelled bad and the poverty just took their breath away. But they came back and on that morning, it was obvious that they had been deeply and profoundly transformed. There were tears, there was emotion. And it was like the spirit of God had invaded their hearts with the mercy and the compassion of Jesus. And I think when they arrived, they weren't asked, would you like the queen bed or would you like the California king with a pillow top mattress? No, they slept in uncomfortable conditions. They had set aside the comfort of home to go be on mission with Jesus. And you know, I we are together right now because some of them are uh, still with us in our church family. And, and if I were to ask right now, would you go back? Are, are you sure you went? If you, no, it was, it was awesome. We stepped out of comfort to see our living God at work. In the, the two towers in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Samwise, remember Samwise? the hobbit companion of Frodo, he said these words, it's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? In the end, it's only a passing thing. This shadow, even darkness, must pass. Jesus, who is the light of the world, came to bring the kingdom of light into the domain of darkness. And when he says, come follow me, we step into that. As he walks and brings light into the darkness, we get to go right with him. It's adventurous, it's exciting, it's dangerous. But here's the deal. There are three demands Jesus makes that are in this text. And the first is to follow Jesus, is to leave the comfort behind as we join the great quest. Disciples should cost followership costs. It will cost us the comforts of this life. So I have to ask, am I a follower of Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Have I decided to follow Jesus and go all in? It's what he demands as part of the package. Now, now the second matter at hand here comes with the second guy. So to another, he said, follow me. There it is, the command to follow him. But he said, mm, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, Jesus then says, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So Jesus does not want to give him permission to go back and bury his dad. So, so uh, scholars have asked the question, like, like what's going on here? Did, did dad just die? And in that Hebrew tradition of the day, it would be, you know, within like uh, two, two days, three days max, that the burial would happen. So it's just like, like, like hey, dad just died. Family's mourning. I got stuff I got to do. I'll just hang on, Jesus. I'll be right with you. But the way Jesus rebukes him, that's probably not what's going on. The scenario is probably more like, look, uh, I'm, the, I'm the eldest son. Uh, Dad's got a lot of holdings. He's got wealth. He's got, he's got land. He's got sheep or crops and, and, and many servants. And there's a lot going on here. And Dad needs my help. But also, when Dad dies, I'm going to inherit all this. And so Jesus, like, like, it's, it's good, okay, but not right now. It's not the right time, Jesus. Some of you that were in the military may be familiar with a practice that recruiters use called like a delayed entry program. Like where you go to the recruiting office and he says, hey, look, you can sign up today, like May 31st, 2020, and you don't have to report for boot camp until like next April. So you're going to get like 11 months to just go back to being an adolescent before you go to boot camp and life gets difficult. But you're going to commit now. But like go live your life. Don't worry about this stuff. And so you come out of there and maybe you got like your, you know, army t-shirt and coffee cup and, and so forth. But the army's really not part of your life yet, is it? By the way, when recruiters do that, they say, you know, if you sign now, I can guarantee you your first duty station will be Hawaii. 
Hello. Right? Uh, all you military guys that were in the military, you know that like like a recruiter, yeah, fork tongue, okay? But the deal is, right, somebody who's not ready to go says they are. And Jesus said, no, I don't I, I don't abide that. See, because if Jesus says, come follow me, and you say, not yet, it's to like lead, let Jesus like walk away without following him. If Jesus says, follow me, and he keeps walking, and you aren't walking with him, guess what you're not doing? You're not following Jesus. And so you've just disobeyed his commandment to come follow him. Another angle on this guy is he's going, you know, I, it, maybe, it's, maybe he's not greedy. Maybe he just goes, look, I got a lot of other things that matter to me that are responsibilities I have. Helping dad, taking care of mom. Maybe you got some sisters that, you know, need, need the protection of a, of, of a big brother and, and dad's getting old and he may die any day. And so, so you know, I, I got to take care of these other things because they are very, very important. In Jesus, you're calling my life. It, it doesn't really compete other than, you know, let me, let me get up my calendar and see how I can fit you in. For Christians, this can be commonplace. That Jesus is just one of many deities, whether it's your, your health or your job or your family or the future success of your children or your schooling or your sports. And so that's your portfolio, just say, okay, so how does Jesus fit? Okay, and so maybe he fits, and I'll watch a YouTube on Sunday morning for an hour and a half. Maybe I'll read my Bible every day for like 15 minutes. But he is not my all in all. He is just part of my diversified portfolio of how to have what feels like a good and happy life. This is the second demand of Jesus. He demands exclusive first place. He demands to be our all in all. And the comparison he's making here is, Jesus is more important than your relationship with your family. He's more important than your health even. It's a question for us all. Is Jesus just another book on the shelf? Is Jesus just another slot on my calendar? But by the way, you can tell a lot about somebody's faith by looking through their calendar and looking through their checkbook. Is Jesus every? Or is he just part of your portfolio? The third demand of Jesus is evident in the interaction with the third character here. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. So he's making the commitment. But let me first say farewell to those at home. Now, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? But Jesus' answer is a little different. You know, with, with the second guy, he says, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but it's for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. He's basically making that contrast that to follow Jesus is to step out of the domain of darkness, where the spiritually dead live, and step into the kingdom of light, where the living live, the ones who have been born again and have everlasting life. And so when we step into that reality, reality, it doesn't make any sense for us to 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 want to like hang out in the old one. I mean, what's offered is so much bigger and better. So there's a bit of a warning here, but also there's a great attraction in following Jesus because we get to live with the living instead of with the dead. But this guy, he just wants to go back for a moment, right? He still says he wants to go back and like say goodbye to his uh, friends and family and and the people at home. And then Jesus says, "No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God." So what he's talking about now is basically the direction of our focus. Is our focus on what we like about this life and our memories of the past, or is our focus on the new life Jesus has given us, which, by the way, is like way better than this life? And the first aspect of this is it is a heart issue. Are you embracing the new life? See, if you were so excited about the new life, you would like get on the plane, you would fly away, you wouldn't want to stop and go back. You would, you would step off from the dock onto the boat. You wouldn't want to be back on the shore because you understand how wonderful it is what Jesus has offered you, knowing that it's going to cost you the comfort of home and knowing that it's like something you need to do like right now and you have to be all in. When you do that, it's going to be great. So if you have the right heart, you wouldn't look bad. 
There's a great story about this in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Genesis. Uh, there's this guy named Lot. Um, Abraham, that patriarch of the Hebrews, is uh, his uncle. And so Lot and his wife and some daughters and some sons-in-law, they live in a city, uh, it's pretty famous, called Sodom. And Sodom is like a real bad place. The people there are like wicked, wicked, wicked. And the Lord takes notice of that. And um, having uh, like chosen Lot to be rescued from that wicked place, he sends angels to warn Lot, saying, look, bad stuff's going to happen. This place is going to be destroyed. we got to get out of here. Well, Lot goes, okay. And his wife goes, okay. And his daughters go, okay. Sons of Lot say, hey, we're fine. Right? We're not buying it. We'll stay back. And so Lot gets delivered from the wicked place. And then God sends fire from heaven down to destroy it. Well, while they're fleeing, and it's like real bad. Everybody, ooh, fire from heaven, scorched. If you go there now, if you go there now, geologists will say there's there, there's like evidence of like lava and burnt sulfur on the ground. There are no ruins there. God actually destroyed the place. True fact. So as they're leaving, they're running away. Lot's wife turns around and looks back. It's a heart issue. I mean, that's where her best friend Lily was hanging out. Maybe she finally found that market where they make the very, very best bread. And oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, the way they roast a lamb there, it's so tasty. I'm going to miss that. And when she looked back at the wicked place from whence she had been delivered, God turns her into a pillar of salt. Basically, like, takes all of the, the stuff of life from her and leaves just behind the minerals. Whoa. Jesus wants our heart to be in the new life and the new kingdom. He wants us to be all in. He doesn't want us to have an interest in looking back at the world we came from. And so it's like an all or nothing plunge he invites us to. Now his answer here, it says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It communicates that truth, don't look back. But it also gets the idea that when you're plowing a furrow, you're looking at where you're going. Like you're looking at the, at the, the stone row ahead or the tree line and, and you're, you're plowing in a straight line. And when you start looking around, the furrow starts to waver and goes crooked. So I said, what I want you to do is I want you to set your eye on what you have committed to do and focus on that and on that alone. He's asking us to fix our eyes on Jesus. He said, follow me. How do you follow somebody? You get behind them. You watch where they're going. And you make sure you don't lose them. <laughs> when, um, when I was in the workaday world, I uh, met a fella, uh, and we had a lot in common. He got to the same school I did. He'd uh, become a naval aviator, a little older than me. His name was Andre. And uh, Andre was a Navy jet pilot, and he was stationed at a base in the Central Valley of California. And uh, there he met his best friend, who would later become his brother-in-law. Andre married this guy's sister. And uh, the two of them, like by day, would be up in their jet planes, uh, flying around in the sky, and sometimes flying formation. Well, as young jet pilots did in that era, we're talking early, mid-70s, uh, he and his buddy went to the Porsche dealer. And they each bought Porsche 911s, two of them. Well, in Hanford, California, where this base is, uh, Naval Air Station Lemoore, um, uh, we're talking big farms, like, you know, 10, 20,000 acre farms, and roads that are laid out just in straight lines, 90 degree angles. So they get out on this county road, and the two Porsches decide they want to pretend they're a formation flying in their jets. And so they are like side by side. One is Andre's future brother-in-law in the lead. Andre is, uh, is his wingman. And he's tucked in with like about four inches between the fenders. His front fender left and, and his buddy's right rear fender. And they're going like 130. Well, Bookie the sheriff is out there with his radar gun. And they get busted. And when the sheriff comes and says, what are you guys doing? That's like crazy dangerous. He says, well, this isn't dangerous at all. Like, 2 o'clock this afternoon, we were doing that like 500 miles an hour. Yes, and, and by the way, as the story ends, he basically says, you aviators, get out of here. Don't do that again. So they didn't even get a citation. But the point is that, that you can get, you can fly like 500 miles an hour in formations with somebody, but the only way you can do it is to focus on them and on them alone. And so if my buddy Andre had been asked, how fast were you going? His answer would be, I have no idea. See, I was flying wing on the lead. 
I have no idea where Jesus is going to take me. But if I tuck in close with Jesus, set my eyes on him, and focus on him alone, and just manage that, that like six inches between me and Jesus, where if he starts to drift away, I tuck in. If he comes toward me, I back off, and I keep him right in the right place relative to me, then Jesus, he can do loops. He can do barrel rolls. He can go 500 miles an hour. He can go Mach 2. He can go hypersonic. He can go fly around Mars and back. And if I am tight with him, I'm going to go wherever, wherever Jesus goes. And where Jesus is going is amazing. To follow Jesus is to go with Jesus. He'll take you to the sky. He'll take us into the pit of the darkest place and deliver light and goodness and salvation. And so when Jesus says, follow me, He's basically saying, look, follow me. It means you got to be willing to abandon the comforts of home. <laughs> it means when I say follow me, like, like, don't waste time. Come now. And I'm not just part of your portfolio. I am everything. And when you follow me, don't let your heart look back. Give your heart fully to me as we together go to glory. That's the calling of Jesus on your life and mine. It's a great high calling. And let me tell you, with surrender, and with prayer, and with humility, you can step right into trail and follow Jesus with all of your life and all of your heart. That's wonderful. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, press this truth into our lives. Move us to choose to follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to do something that um, may uh, make you cringe, but uh, I, I like to lead you in a little song. I'm just going to do it a cappella because it's such a perfect fit. And uh, as we sing this song, may it be the prayer of all of our hearts. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Well, I hope that that was the prayer of your heart, to have decided to follow Jesus. And as we walk with him, he's got wondrous things in store for us. On the other side of this stormy passage of the pandemic, there is a far shore that is the golden shore. He's prepared wondrous things for the world around us, and we get to be part of delivering people from darkness to light, from death to life. And so our great prayer should be one of salvation and of deliverance that he would set us free, and he would set those around us free. And so as we walk together, hear these words, not a him who is able to keep you from stall, stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And right where you sit, we can all join together and say in the name of Jesus, Amen. Looking forward to being together soon. Um, if you have a few minutes right now, check out uh, the uh, Zoom uh, coffee hour. You can get your coffee, uh, sit down in your jammies, and like hang out with your friends, little squares on the screen. It's a good thing to do. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We're looking forward to that day we can be together. But until then, he's with us, and he's leading us in power, isn't he? Amen.